Okay, it's 1 p.m. Welcome everyone to Drisha Spring Program. And this is the first class uh, in this session on exploring the philosophy of halakha. In this short course, we'll explore three questions about the halakhic system as a whole. The first question concerns the amount of room that the system has for creativity and diversity. The second question concerns the relationship between halachic categories and ethical categories. And the final question concerns the relationship between th truth and justice. When the evidence is insufficient, is the role of the judge to uncover the facts or to heal the discord? The, this first class will focus on pluralism and halakha. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Samuel Liebens. Uh, Dr. Liebens is a philosopher at the University of Haifa and adjunct professor. Uh, faculty at Risha. His first book is about uh, Bertrand Russell and the philosophy of language. His second book, The Principles of Judaism, uh, forthcoming with Oxford University no, Press. No, it's, it's published, it's published. Oh, it is published, sorry. Okay, published with Oxford University Press. Uh, it's uh, a contemporary explore, exploration of the uh, philosophical underpinning of the Jewish faith, and it is published. Uh, he's also the co-founder of the Association for the Philosophy of Judaism. And with that, I'll turn this to Dr. Levens. Sorry Thank for my error. Much. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Can I can I share screen, please? Yes. Uh, I'll leave this in one moment. OK, there you go. Great. OK, so uh, we have some slides for you today. Philosophy of Jewish law. And this is our first class. What I what I wanted to do today in, a, in this first cl class is to share with you um, a chapter of a book that I had the honor of editing with together with the other co-founders of the Association for the Philosophy of Judaism, a book called uh, Jewish Philosophy in an Analytic Age. And it's a collection of, of, of papers of contemporary Jewish philosophy. And, and the chapter that I'd like to explore with you today uh, was written by Jeff Helmreich. And it's uh, the chapter is called The Jewish Prudential Puzzle as Old as the Talmud. And ultimately, uh, what what Helmreich does in this paper it is, as the title says, is to motivate, is to, is to establish the contours of a problem or a puzzle uh, at the heart of the halachic system. Uh, a, a jurisprudence is, is uh, the philosophy of law, broadly speaking. So it's a, it's a philosophical question at the heart of the legal Jewish system. And actually, the problem comes up in, in many legal systems. And the problem emerges because there's a conflict between two principles that, so to speak, govern the halachic system as a whole, kind of meta principles uh, of the halachic system. And the first one he calls pluralism. And, and in order to uh, animate our understanding of pluralism, uh, Helmreich brings uh, a, a very, very famous uh, Gemara, from uh, tractate Erevin of, of the, uh, the Babylonian Talmud. It says, Amar Rabbi Abba Amar Shmuel. So Rabbi Abba said in the name of Shmuel, Shalosh Shanim Nechleku Beit Shammai Uveit Hillel. There were two academies in uh, Tanaitic Israel, uh, one named after Hillel, the Academy of Hillel, and one named after Shammai, the Academy of Shammai. And they were, um, engaged in a very uh, pronounced disagreement for three years. Um, one group said the halakha, the Jewish law, goes like us. And the other guys said halakha kemotenu. No, the halakha goes like us. Jewish law is in accord with our teachings. A heavenly voice came out, came out of nowhere, and said, Vamra, Elu Elu divrei Elokim Chayim Hain. It's a very, very famous uh, uh, statement of what you might think halachic, you might call it halachic pluralism. No, in a sense, they're both wrong, right? They're wrong that the halacha is just like us and just like us. They're both the words of the living God. The halacha. <laughs> Beit Hillel, and then it seems to go back on itself and say, but actually, the halacha goes with Beit Hillel. Well, since they are both, you know, the Gemara basically picks up on this, this, the strangeness of this statement. Hold on a minute. You, 
you seem to be saying two conflicting things. On the one hand, you're saying, Elu ve'elu divalikim chaim, they're both the words of the living God. And then you're saying the halacha is like one of them. Well, why? Mipnei ma zachu beit hillel likboa halacha kmotan. Like, what did they do to, to merit having the halacha follow them? And the Gemara answers, Mipnei shenochin va'aluvin hayu. Because they were kind of laid back and, and, and um, what's the word that, uh, uh, forbearing. I was going to say foreboding. That's not the right word at all. Forbearing, right? The shonim divrehen v'divrei beit shamai. When beit Hillel, when the academy of Hillel would teach Jewish law, even though they thought the halacha was like them, because of their great tolerance, their great open-mindedness, their great respect towards those with whom they disagreed, they would always teach the words of Beit, Sh Beit Shammai as well as their own words. And not just that. They would actually teach Beit Shammai's position first as a, as a sign of the great honor that they gave to those with whom they disagreed. And it was, it was in virtue of that uh, that the Halakha follows them, which is kind of interesting. It, 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 the, the Halakha seems to follow them not because of the proprietary, the propriety of what they said. The halacha seems to follow them, not because their arguments were better, not because what they said was right, but for some other kind of reason, because of some extra virtue they had, and, and, and so to speak, God uh, wanted to favor them uh, in virtue of that, but not in virtue of their superior uh, reasoning or something like that. Now, what Helmreich wants to take from this Gemara uh, is that there's a sense in which the halachic system gives weight to conflicting answers. And, and in order to, to flesh this out further, he quotes uh, the Ritva, who was a, uh, a Spanish medieval commentator on the Talmud. I don't have a picture of the actual Ritva, but to me, that's what the Ritva looks like. That's the, uh, that's the Mossad, I think that's the Mossad Rav Kook uh, um, collection of, of uh, Ritva's, uh, Ritva's uh, uh, teachings on, on Shas, on the Talmud. And uh, in his commentary to this Gemara in Masecha Eirevin, he, he says the following, Elu ve'elu divrei lukim chayim. These and these are the words of the living God. Sha'alu rabbinei tzarfat. The French rabbis of blessed memory asked a question. How can they both be the words of the living God if one's saying it's forbidden and one's saying it's permitted? They, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai can't both be right if, if they're taking um, the diametrically opposite view of one another. I see something in the chat. Um, the law goes like Beit Hillel because their ways are more peaceful. Peace is greater than truth. It's very nice. Obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in our third class, actually. So, so uh, remember that. But that's, that seems to be right. They're being rewarded for the peace. And it seems like peace matters more than, than, than truth. Uh, that, that seems to be a, um, seems to be a legitimate. Oh, oh, I'll put the, somebody asked me to put the English up as well. Yes, I have the English as well. I have the English for most of them. Uh, um, I, I, and when I don't, I, I will translate them. Um, the Tirtsu, the French rabbis answered their question, right? Ki, they, they don't answer it like Ozzy. They don't say, oh, because truth doesn't matter uh, as much as peace. They say, no, they're both true. What Beit Hillel said and what Beit Shammai said are both kind of right. How can that be? Ki when Moses went up high to Mount Sinai to collect the, uh, the Torah, the Kabbalah Torah, Hera Olan al kol davar v'davar, he was shown that for every single matter, mem tet panim le isur u mem tet panim le heter, there are 49 aspects or 49 faces, to give a literal translation, of forbiddenness and 49 faces of permission. So basically, for any given question, if you are sufficiently learned in Torah, you'll be, you'll be able to find 49 reasons to permit anything uh, and 49 reasons to forbid the very same thing. 
ושאל הקדוש ברוך הוא על זה, and Moshe asked God about this, that's really weird, why have you done that? ואמר, and God said to him, שיהיה זה מסור לחכמי ישראל. Well, this has been handed over to the sages of Israel. שבכל דור ודור יהיה הקראה כמותם. That in every generation, the sages of Israel have a certain amount of uh, uh, flexibility um, to rule one way or another, and the Torah will kind of follow them. Um, and there's a sheretz, right? A sheretz is a creepy crawly, and a creepy crawly uh, in Jewish law, a sheretz is, uh, is a very toxic thing in terms of... Um, ritual impurity in, in terms of uh, uh, contaminating things with ritual impurity. Uh, 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 Beth Elstein asks, does that imply that there is no absolute truth? Well, that's the question. What does this uh, imply about truth? And we, we're gonna have to think about it. Remember, one thing to bear in mind, I think, is that when we're dealing with legal questions, even though these laws according to, to Jewish thought, are rooted in the divine will. It's not like questions of a matter of scientific fact. You know, you could say like, um, is the spin of this electron or this particle, sorry, the spin of this particle, is it up or is it down? That's a question that it, it's not up to me whether it's up or down. It's not up to anyone else whether it's up or down. It's a mitziyut, it's a state of nature. And, you know, we just have to discover. But whether you're asking something is asur, or mutar, you might think there's no independent fact. It's a conventional fact, right? Um, in Israel, if you see red and then white and then red and then white on the, on the side of the sidewalk, that means don't park. But in Britain, that doesn't mean don't park. You need to have two yellow lines uh, are painted on the street. That's what means don't park in Britain. And you say, oh, well, is there some fact of the matter what two yellow lines means on a road? No, there's no fact of the matter outside of human conventions. So you might think, yeah, there are absolute truths. There are absolute truths about matters of natural fact, like is the spin of this particle up or down, but there might not be absolute truth with regard to certain legal facts, because legal facts might depend upon convention and convention might leave things somewhat uh, up in the air. Certainly it seems like these sources are, are, are giving the rabbis a tremendous amount of latitude because for any given question, you can find 49 reasons to say yes and 49 reasons to say no. And so to speak, until the rabbis have decided, it's kind of underdetermined. Uh, Helmreich brings um, a, a, another rabbinic source about the sheretz. Uh, I didn't translate this because it's only one line. It's from Masechet Sanhedrin 17a. Ama Rabbi Yehuda Ama Rav. So Rabbi Judah says in the name of Rav. Ein Moshivin Sanhedrin. We would not let somebody join the Sanhedrin. Apart from somebody who could find a legal reason for purifying a Sheretz. Now that's impossible. That's like squaring a circle. Now, I don't know what to do with this, Gemara. And to be fair, I don't think Helmreich does either because it seems like it might be a hyperbole because it's actually literally impossible to, um, to purify in Jewish law a sheretz. And some of the commentators on this text understand it to mean something like, can you give something like a convincing argument, even though it's clearly for a falsehood? You know, like in... Um, in a debating society, you would sometimes be asked to debate for a, uh, um, a cause that you don't believe in, just in order to see how good your rhetorical skills are. So it might not really be that they were actually able to be, yes, intellectual dexterity, as, as uh, Beth said. So it might not really be that they actually, they really had the power to go that far. Because if that's the case, then the rabbis can never be wrong. And that doesn't seem to be right because there are there, there's there's a, a large body of literature from the Talmud onwards about what to do when uh, when rabbis make mistakes in Jewish law. We'll come back to that. But nonetheless, it seems fair to say, fair to say that there is some degree of latitude, right? Uh, which which with 
we're talking a bit about halachic creativity in, 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 in today's lecture, in today's class. Um, the creativity has room to flourish because the Jewish law seems to give the rabbis a certain degree of latitude. So this is how Helmreich uh, um, um, formulates this principle of halachic pluralism. It says, I'll assume for now that the Talmud, uh, that, sorry, that, that, that Talmudic realist pluralism, the, by, by realist pluralism, he means that the Talmud really says there are 49, 49 senses in which this is mutar and 49 senses in which this is a source. So 49 ways in which it's permitted and 49 ways in which it's forbidden. So there's a sense in which it's both permitted and forbidden, at least until uh, a decision is made. So it's, and, and that's like, a, as a matter of legal fact, that's why he uses this word realist. He says, I will assume for now that Talmudic realist pluralism applies at least, and perhaps only, because, like I said, there's a question of how literal these sources are being, right? Can you really e even purify a sheretz, a creepy crawly? And I don't think you can. And neither does, does Helmreich. He says, so perhaps it only applies to a, a limited number of cases, but it applies at least to these cases. A. It applies to answers to what the philosopher of law, Ronald Dworkins, calls disputive bivalent questions of law, which is just a very posh name for questions like this. Is X kosher or unkosher? Is X forbidden or permitted? Is X pure or impure? We're talking about legal questions where there's only two possible answers, yes or no. Lots of legal questions have many more than two possible answers, right? For instance, how much should you be fined for a certain crime? Well, that could be anywhere between zero dollars and an infinite number of dollars, right? So that's not one of the sorts of questions we're talking about. We're talking about questions where there are only two possible answers, either kosher or unkosher, forbidden or permitted, pure or impure. And let's say, let's restrict our attention only to cases where you could reasonably get support from the sources for either direction. So, so the Sheretz case, the creepy crawly, let's not really count that. That's a hyperbole in the Talmud. Let's concentrate on cases where you have a legal question, is X kosher or unkosher, forbidden or permitted, pure or impure, where there seems to be some support for both sides from the sources. The example he brings is relatively innocuous, but it, it's a fair example. The example he brings is, are Ashkenazi Jews permitted to eat quinoa like quinoa, I don't know how you pronounce it in, in different places, but quinoa, quinoa on, quinoa. right, uh, this South American kind of ricey grain, are Ashkenazi Jews permitted to eat it? It's a grass. On Pesach. It depends who you ask. And the reason it depends who you ask, oh, it's a grass, is it? But, but the, the reason it depends who you ask is because there are actually reasonable arguments for both sides. I have my own position. Um, the question is, how do you understand the minhag of kitniot, uh, do you you know do you understand it kind of as a minhag to treat it as a gazera? Is it somehow a gazera? Does it apply to all legumes? What are legumes? Can it apply to things that we had no tradition to you know not to eat uh, beforehand? Or, or you know so it, it seems like there is room here for reasonable disagreement. Even though I have my own position, I can see that. So he says that would be a, the sort of question where you can see. Uh, uh, the Talmud would seem to accept a certain amount of pluralism, at least until the authorities come to a consensus. Okay, so I, I see a question, I saw a, or a comment come up. Can, could, you apply, could you apply fuzzy logic? And so that's a nice question. Um, so the word bivalent means you've only got two options. And, and classical logic is also bivalent because anything you want to say is either true or false. There's no in between. Uh, but in recent years, logicians have developed something called fuzzy logic to deal with vagueness. And, and what's interesting is in a throwaway comment in the book, The Halachic Mind, Rav Soloveitchik argued that the Talmud might actually have a non bivalent logic, it might have a multivalent logic, which is a fuzzy logic, but I'm not going to go into that. Let's just assume things are either true or false. 
things are either true or false. However, when you get into law, it gets a bit trickier because truth or fal falsity, first of all, has to be legislated. So there can be gaps in the law in a way that there aren't um, gaps in physical reality. Um, so the, the, the Talmud ha adopts a certain type of pluralism towards questions like this. So that's the first doctrine that's gonna get us into this philosophical problem. The second doctrine he calls faithfulness. In order to explain what he means by faithfulness, he shares, Helmreich shares, a really beautiful prayer. It's the prayer of Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana. It's quoted in the, the Mishnah in, in uh, Tractate Brachot, and then it's elaborated upon by a brighter that the Gemara quotes. And it's a prayer that you're supposed to say upon entering the Bet Midrash, upon entering the study hall. And the words of the prayer go like this. May it be the will before you, Lord my God, that no catastrophe should happen at my hand. I'm about to learn and something really bad could happen. Why? Please God, make it your will that I won't stumble in a matter of Jewish law. And my friends should rejoice in me. I should make a, 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 a positive contribution to the, the intellectual environment of the bed, bed Midrash. And that I shouldn't say that something that is impure is pure. And I shouldn't say that something uh, that is pure is impure. And, and so too, God, may it be your will that my friends, my colleagues, won't stumble in the matter of halacha. And I will be happy with them. It's a beautiful prayer. But what it implies heavily is that it's very much possible for the rabbis to make a mistake, to rule incorrectly. Okay? Which seems peculiar because if there's a wide scope of of questions which have only one of two answers like is it tame or is it tahor or is it tahor or is it tame and the, the talmud adopts a pluralism regarding a lot of those questions why be worried that you go wrong kind of whatever you say will be right no we're pluralistic here anything goes at least within this this uh, uh, um, qualified realm of questions. So uh, uh, likewise, um, in, in order to explain what this doctrine of faithfulness is, Helmreich uh, quotes the words of Rabbi J. David Bleich. Uh, I spelled Bleich wrong, sorry. He said, disagreement abounds in natural sciences, no less so than in halakha, but in picking and choosing between contradictory and conflicting theses, the scientist acts on the basis of the canons of his discipline as understood by his quite fallible intellect, not on the basis of subjective predilections. The halachic decisor faces the same constraints. The idea is, yeah, as, as, Beth, as Beth said, you need support for both of your positions. And we'll, we'll get back to what the nature of that support is. Um, and that's what faithfulness is all about. Faithfulness is you can't just say, oh, whatever I want goes. No, you have to find a, a justification for your position. And it's as if the attitude you have to have as you approach Jewish law is you're trying to discover what the law says. You're not trying to discover what you think. You're not trying to discover what you'd like to discover. You're trying to uncover the truth. Now, sometimes the data, you know, is less than compelling one way or the other. That's true in scientific uh, research as well. So sometimes you have to take a plunge on one side or on the other, but you don't just follow you know, a subjective predilection. You, you, know, you, you, you try your very best to go where the data is pointing you. Um, but this gives rise to the problem. There's some quinoa. Um, this is just a quote from Helmreich's paper. The problem is 
that pluralism effectively rules out, you know, so the question is, is quinoa allowed or isn't it allowed? That's the question. Not to be or not to be. You know, that one was dealt with by Shakespeare. It's not to be or not to be. The question is to eat quinoa or not to eat quinoa. And the problem is that pluralism effectively rules out that there's any such answer to be found. We're, that's the answer we're looking for, but pluralism says there's no such answer to be found. This case being one, let's assume, in which the sources can reasonably be read or taught either way. The doctrine of pluralism warrants the presumption that the actual law, the Torah, as Rick Va defines it, counts both contradictory answers as correct. That's not to say I can pick an answer at random, that's what Beth pointed out. I can't just flip a coin. I have to try to uncover the correct answer from the sources, just as faithfulness, the doctrine of faithfulness demands. But if I know and keep in mind that neither of the two incompatible answers is singled out as the correct answer because of the truth of pluralism, how can I go about seeking the one established by the sources? How can I look for the answer favored or grounded by authorities that I already know favor neither one because of Talmudic pluralism? There hasn't yet been a bat coal that's come out, a heavenly voice and said, you must follow the Orthodox Union on this matter, right? There. So at the moment, you could, you could still say it's Elu ve Elu divre lekim chayim, pluralism rules. And you're asking me to go out and find the answer favored by the halakha. But I know that there's no such thing as the answer favored by halakha because of, of the doctrine of halakhic pluralism. Yet, what else is it to consult the sources so as to see which answer is correct and by implication incorrect? The very act of reading sources as establishing P, i.e. quinoa is kosher for Pesach, when you're regarding a bivalent dispositive question, such as whether something is forbidden or permitted, looking at the sources to find such an answer involves viewing them as ruling out not P. Yet pluralism already tells me that doing so would be unwarranted. He has a nice mashal, a nice analogy. Here is... Uh, the hors d'oeuvres menu of a nice restaurant, right? You see all these different hors d'oeuvres. And the waiter comes to you and you say to the waiter, uh, I have no preference which entree you give me, as long as you pick me the one I, genu I genuinely prefer. Right? Like, it's always like, I, I, have no, I have no preference which entree you give me, as long as you give me the one that I want the most. Well, what does that even mean? An halachic decisor is placed in a similar position. It's like they're God's or the Torah's waiter on this analogy. I'm supposed to go and find out what God prefers, my not eating quinoa or, his, or, or my yes eating quinoa on Pesach, but God himself is telling me because of halachic pluralism that there is actually no answer, right? There's no, there's no one right answer. That's the puzzle. And I would, I would say you could actually throw another doctrine into the mix, which Helmreich doesn't, um, doesn't relate to. And I would call it the doctrine of creativity, which is there are cases in which halachic authorities are praised for their creativity, right? But if faithfulness is that you're not supposed to be creative, you're supposed to uncover the halachic facts, then that's going to be in tension with the Talmudic value uh, or the value the Talmud places upon halachic creativity. Piana de Bey Eliyahu Zutta, um, a, a late midrashic, so it's not that late, about the same time that the Talmud was redacted, um, um, a midrashic source, relatively late midrashic source, provides an analogy in order to explain the value of the oral tradition. Mashal lama adava domer, a comparison to, to what is it similar? Lamelech basar vadam, to a king of flesh and blood. Shayalo shnei avadim, he had two servants. Vahaya ohavana havagdolan, he loved them with a great love. 
He gave them both a measure of wheat as a present. He also gave them a bunch of flax. So he gave each of the king gave each of his beloved servants some wheat and some, some flax. The wise one of the two servants. Natalita Pishtan, he took the flax, Va'arag Mapayafa, he weaved a beautiful tablecloth. Vanatalita Chitin, and he took the wheat. Va'asan Solet, he made flour. Va'arara, Vetchina, Vetachana, he, 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 he crushed it and sorted it and, and did all the things you need to do to it. He made it into dough and he baked it. Vesidrash, ala Shulchan. And he placed it out nicely on the on the table. Ufarasale amapayafa, and he placed uh, on top of it this really lovely tablecloth. Vehnicho achaba hamelech, and he waited. He waited it there. He wait, He left it there until the king came to visit. But the foolish one, the asaklum, just didn't do anything. Just left the flour as wet, left the wheat as wheat, and left the flax as flax. Ezemahen chaviv. Which of the two was more beloved to the king? When God gave at a Torah to Israel, he gave the, the, the Torah to, to the Jews. He didn't give them. He, he gave it to them as wheat from which we were charged to make bread. And, 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 and like flat like flax from which we were supposed to make a garment. The idea is the foolish one is the one who takes the written law and does nothing with it. Maybe the Karaites or the Sadducees, the people who don't believe in the oral law. But the wise one is like the rabbis. He takes what God gives him and he adds initiative of his own. And he actually changes the form of the thing and he's praised for doing it. More radically still, in Avot de, de Rebbe Natan, which is again a, a kind of a, a, a late uh, collection uh, that kind of, some people think of it as like a, um, an addendum to, to Pirkei Avot, a, a late addendum to Pirkei Avot. Um, in, there are different versions of it. In the Shechter version Bet, the following thing comes up in the 13th Perek. It's an amazing story. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, uh, had been berating his student, Rebliezer, for not being sufficiently creative, for only repeating traditions he'd heard from his teachers and not saying anything of his own. And after being berated, this is what happened. Vahaya Rebliezer, Yoshev Vidoresh, he sat and he expounded, Dvarim yoter mimash ne'emala Moshe Besinai. This is so radical. He sat and he said things over and above that which was said to Moshe on the Sinai. irot and his face shone like like the the light of the sun. The karnotav karnotav shel Moshe, and beams of light, or if you're uh, Michelangelo, horns, right, uh, came out of his head just like the horns of Moshe Rabbeinu, right? The, the, beams, the beams of light that came out of um, Moshe, Moshe's face came out of Eliezer's face. So bright was his countenance, nobody knew if it was day or night. Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Shimon ben Netanel, Halchuva Amrul, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. No, so it wasn't Shimon ben Yochai, it was Yochanan ben Zakkai with the teacher, sorry. But Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Shimon went off to get the teacher. They went off to get Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And they said to him, Bo, vera'a Rabbi Eliezer, Yoshev v'doresh dvarim, yotem emashinem ala Moshe Besinai. Come and see your student Rabbi Eliezer. He's finally taken to heart your rebuke. And now he's teaching things um, over and above what, what was said to Moshe at Sinai. And his face is shining like the, the light of the sun and his beams are coming out of his face like the beams of Moshe and nobody around there can even tell if it's day or night so bright is his countenance. Ba, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. So he came, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai came, he came from behind Rabbi Yezer. 
arosha, he kissed him on his head, the Amar, and he said, Ashrechem Avraham Yitzchak Yaakov, blessed are the forefathers, that someone like this should come from their progeny. Right? So you have this notion that on the one hand, the Torah has given us a certain amount of latitude such that there aren't right or wrong answers to what Dawkins calls bivalent dispositive questions. You know, is it mutar, is it asur, is it uh, tame, is it tahor? So long as there's some scriptural evidence you could bring one way or the other. On the other hand, we're instructed when doing the process of legislating Jewish law, we're instructed to abide by the doctrine of faithfulness, where we go about trying to uncover what the law has to teach us. We're not trying to put ourselves into the law. And then yet again, on the other hand, we have these, these places in the rabbinic literature where people are praised for seemingly adding things of their own initiative, their own creativity, even ingredients of their own. Because you can't make bread just with the wheat. You have to add some water and have to add initiative and have to change its form. And here, Rabbi Yezer is saying things, over and above that which was said to Moses at Sinai. And he's praised for it there. Oh, how are we going to solve this problem? That's the riddle. Okay. And one su suggestion that Helmreich thinks about is dial down the faithfulness. Take the doctrine of faithfulness and, and change it a bit. Maybe it's not so true, that doctrine of faithfulness. Maybe that's the wrong way of thinking about psa how Psak Halacha goes. One way you might think that, he gives an example. He says it was the Briska Rav, but I'm not sure he's actually right. I think it was Rav Chaim of Brisk, the father of the Briska Rav, which is why you'll see the photo I show in a moment. Steve has said to all panelists, so it seems we will always have these issues through all time because we sort of signed up for it when we agreed to accept the Torah. I'm gonna to get back to, uh, 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 to this sort of comment later, Steve, but that's a nice comment. Um, so I, I think this story was actually uh, uh, Rav Chaim of Brisk, the, the, the father of the Brisk Arab. So that's why this, uh, my photo is of him. But the, the question is that the story is that a poor woman came to him and wanted to know if her chicken was kosher. And before he would issue a ruling, he asked this question, how many chickens do you own? Because if she had more than one chicken, he, he might have been more stringent. But knowing that she, she only has one, he'll try to, I suppose, find every loophole in the book. That doesn't look like faithfulness. That looks like a rabbi following a rabbinic agenda. Right? So maybe the doctrine of faithfulness needs to be re-understood. And you've got plenty of other examples. Some of these are Helmreich, some of them are mine. There's the rebellious son, where the, the Torah seems to say you should execute a rebellious son who... who who um, satisfy certain conditions, but the rabbis place so many restrictive interpretations upon these conditions that they basically make it impossible ever to occur. Indeed, one opinion is that it never did occur. The same thing happens with the death penalty. There seems to be some sort of rabbinic agenda against the death penalty, that, that if it's ever justified, it's as a last resort. And they seem to have put so many checks and balances in the way of the death penalty that it, it ultimately became inoperative. Um, you have a constant refrain in the Talmud, um, and, and though there are plenty of people who believe, I think for good reason, that um, rabbinic authorities today could do more for the plight of chained women in Jewish law, uh, there is nonetheless a constant refrain in the Talmud that when it is, um, yet yeah, when it is, um, sorry, there's a constant refrain in the Talmud that when it is to help an aguna, there is an agenda to be lenient, okay, um, to rule leniently. And uh, f uh, finally, I thought of the notion of Prusbal, which is Hillel, you know, Hillel Hazakain, he found a loophole to get out of some of the biblical laws of um, of loan, loaning and repaying a loan uh, around the Shemitah year, around the seventh year of, of the of the of the of the of the 
seven year cycle. Um, he found some sort of formal way to get around it. He had good reason, good, good, uh, you know, so solid reasons, but it does look like, to use the uh, oft quoted refrain of, of Blue Greenberg, where there's a halachic will, there's a halachic way. So don't give me this notion of faithfulness. Oh, what we do when we discover, uh, well, what we do when we learn halakha is we try to uncover what the Torah has to say. No, we bring, um, we, we bring our own um, agenda to the table. However, it's not as simple as that. And uh, great, greatly though I respect Blue Greenberg, I think that that notion of where there's a halachic will, there's a halachic way is sometimes blown out of proportion. And Jeff Helmreich writes, these examples are kind of misleading. He gives two reasons. First, they're actually exceptional, which is part of why they're famous. They're famous because they don't happen very often. It's as if faithfulness is the rule, and then sometimes you're allowed to be creative or follow an agenda. One wonders whether a decisor would have attained the authoritative stature of the Briskarav, or a Chaim of Brisk, whoever it was, if they were known to be this, if, if this were known to be his general practice instead of a celebrated departure from it. Indeed, as someone's been saying in the comments, the Briskers were actually known for, for being very stringent generally. Um, so there are Heta Iska selling Hametz, as people are, are giving other examples. There are times where we kind of adopt loopholes, but they're noteworthy for being exceptions. And part of the reason that the Briskarav and his father, Rebchaim of Brisk, were so um, renowned and, and therefore had broad enough halachic shoulders to every now and again make an agenda based exception was because that's not what they generally did. Second, the process of faithfully consulting sources need not be understood narrowly. There's more to correctness than what the explicit textual sources dictate about the question at hand. As Eliezer Berkowitz argued, the authoritative sources also include underlying or core principles such as mercy, justice, ways of peace in the world, and so on that can sometimes trump positive law in setting the final ruling. And here, Jeff Helmreich is referring to Rabbi Yezer Berkowitz's book, Not in Heaven. Appealing to such principles as the, the Briska Rav arguably did is a more sophisticated way of seeking correctness, not an alternative to it. You see, what, what he's saying here is in those exceptions where it looks like the rabbis aren't being faithful to the letter of the law, it's only in cases where they're also being faithful to a, a larger spirit of the law, not their own narrow agenda and not their own subjective predilections, but they would, they would claim that in those very exceptional cases, there's some sort of trumping principle, but the principle didn't come from nowhere, it's there in the halachic system too. Okay. So it, it's not gonna be so easy just to discount faithfulness and thereby get away from this puzzle. Moreover, and he thinks this is the more fundamental uh, reason to avoid um, just dumping the doctrine of faithfulness, rabbinic decisors are exhorted to investigate thoroughly and humbly, asking God's help in preventing a mistake, like in the prayer in Mesechet Brachot. Again, this strenuousness like all trappings of seriousness, integrity, and effort in halachic research, they become absurd if the opposing answer would be equally correct. Why worry or work so hard? The puzzle hasn't gone away. So another way to get round the puzzle was suggested by, to, to, to Jeffrey Helmreich by my colleague and the co-editor of the book, Aaron Siegel here pictured, is maybe we have to re-understand or perhaps dial down the pluralism of Jewish law. Maybe when it says Elu ve Elu Divrelu Kim Chayim, maybe when it says, uh, so I was just looking at the comments and, and Beth's making a, a fair point, which is that some things change over time, certain values change over time, but that itself might be written, like, think about women's issues, that itself might be written in uh, to the halachic process, and we'll come back to that. Um, nonetheless, right? even in those innovations in Jewish law 
uh, to, to, to try to address the unlevel playing field between men and women, when done sincerely and strenuously with integrity as part of the halachic system, they're not just making it up as they go along, they're trying to discover what they take to be the correct interpretation. Anyway, to get out of the puzzle, Aaron Siegel suggested to Jeff Heim, uh, Helmreich, maybe we should say it's not Elu Videi, Elu Divrei Chaim, that both answers are equally correct. Maybe it's just that, look, both answers count as correct for practical purposes, even though only one gets the sources right. Right, there is a fact of the matter. Is it Tame or is it Tahor? But don't worry. If you tried your hardest to find the answer and you made a mistake, then somehow that's good enough and you're allowed to rely on it practically. And that's what we mean by Elu, elu Divrei Olokim Chaim. It means something like, it means something like, he calls it procedural pluralism. There's an idea in, in, in uh, the philosophy of law called procedural justice. We might come back to this in the final class. The question is, is justice after the truth, you know, you want to get the verdict right to acquit the innocent and convict the guilty? Or is justice about following the right procedure? Right, because we can't always know who is actually innocent and who is actually guilty. And the job of, of the judiciary and the job of a, of a justice system is to follow fairly a fair procedure. Um, so if you've had your Miranda rights respected, then we can go ahead, for example. If you didn't have your Miranda rights respected, we can't go ahead. And I don't care about whether he was actually guilty. Doesn't matter, the procedure wasn't followed, so there's no justice, okay? This is a notion of procedural justice. So you could have a notion of procedural pluralism. As a matter of fact, God knows whether it's Tame or Tahor, but he didn't actually give us enough evidence to discover for sure which one. So as long as we followed the procedure as faithfully as we could, then once you've done that, you're allowed to rely on whichever, whichever verdict you came up with, not because it's true, but because it's good enough. Something like due process, that's right. Okay. But there's problems with that too, right? The basic problem is the rabbinic sources make it look as if you can be wrong. There's this Gemara from uh, Sanhedrin Yerushalmi, even if you did things faithfully, um, Amarav Yanai, Rabbi Yanai said, this is from the, 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 Babylon, the, the Palestinian Talmud, the Yushalmi. Amarav Yanai, Rabbi Yanai said, Ilu torah Had the law been given to us really, really clearly, making clear what, um, you know, what the law is, lo haita No foot would have standing. The idea, we're, we're lucky that God didn't make things too clear, that he gave us a certain wiggle room um, because we do get things wrong from time to time. We, you know, and, we, and we're gonna get things wrong a lot, uh, potentially. Um, if, some, if, if substantive pluralism is false, says Helmreich, and there is only one right answer, then most of them, and the practices based on them would be in error, however well-meaning. But what Rabbi Yana is saying here in his source is that no, we're lucky that God didn't kind of give us only one right answer. Because if he did, we'd most, most of the time be wrong. It's not that he only gave us one right answer, he gave us many right answers. So how does this source continue? Because I don't have the English translation here, I'll, I'll use my spotlight. So can, people see, can people see a red dot now on the screen? Uh, yes. Yeah. Good. Okay, so, or a pen, okay. So, Supposed to be a spotlight there. Uh, had he given uh, us the Torah with clear answers, no one would have a leg to stand on. Why does the Torah keep saying, God spoke to Moses saying? 
So it's a kind of a cute question. The way I take it is that the, the Gemara wants to know, like, what did they have to talk about? What, you know, why so many conversations? Um, and, I'll, and the Gemara says, I'll tell you what they were talking about. Moses said before God, Hodiene, tell me. Tell me what is the right answer? What is the halacha? And God responded, Amarullah. God said to him, Rabim Lahatot. Follow the majority. I'm not going to tell you what the right halacha is. The point is, there is no right halacha. There's more than one right way to go. This isn't merely procedural. Right? Um, it says, follow the majority. Acharei Rabim Lahatot. Rabu Hamazakin Zacho. If, if the majority vindicate him, then he's innocent. Rabu Hamachayevin Chayevo. And if the, if, the, if the majority obligate him, then he's obligated. And God did this for a certain reason, Kadesh Tehea Torah Nidreshet, so that the Torah would be learnt and you would find 49 reasons to say that any given thing is, tam, is Tameh, Memtet Panim Tameh, and you'd find 40 right reason, 49 reasons to say that something is Tahor. And basically, the way Jeffrey Helmreich, Helmreich reads this source, he's saying it's not plausible that the pluralism here is only procedural, but that there's actually one right answer. If there is actually one right answer, God could have at least told Moshe and said, Moshe, keep it a secret, though. He didn't. There is no right answer. It depends how you guys decide. Right. And that's exactly what you see. There's an amazing story. I do have the English here. There's an amazing story in, in Baba Metzia about the death of Rabbi Banachmani. And in the in the midst of the story about his death. Right. We hear about a safek, a doubt, in the Bet Midrash in heaven. God and the, and the angels are learning. And the heavenly debate concerned a case of uncertainty as to which came first, the spot or the hair, in a case of leprosy, right? Um, and the Holy One, blessed be he, said, well, if you're not certain whether the spot came first or the hair came first, God said the individual is pure. But all the angels ruled the other way. And they said, no, he's impure. And they said, oh, my goodness, who can arbitrate this dispute for us? And they agreed that Rabbi Banachmani should arbitrate. Since Rabbi Banachmani once said, I am preeminent in the halachot of leprosy and I am preeminent in the halachot of ritual impurity imparted by tense. I'm an expert in this field. So God and the angels turn to, to Rabbi Banachmani for his uh, ruling. What seems clear, and you have a couple of minutes, uh, but what seems clear from this source is that it's not that there is a correct answer, Right, but we're allowed to rely on procedure. It seems like there isn't one right answer, at least not until Rabbi Banachmani decides. But before he decides, it seems like it's somewhat up in the air. Because if, if even God doesn't know, and God is omniscient, God knows everything, then it must be up in the air. Okay, so I'm going to basically I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say like this, and, and, to, and to, I'm going to try and wrap this up in the next class. But where I'm going to leave it is as follows. We have three doctrines. Faithfulness, pluralism, and creativity. Faithfulness tells us that when we try to learn the halakha, our job is to seriously, strenuously, and with uh, uh, integrity, search for the halachic fact of the matter. That's the doctrine of faithfulness, and we pray that God will help us succeed. Pluralism is the view that for many questions where there's only one of two answers possible, um, both answers are, are somehow equally legitimate. That's the doctrine of pluralism. And Creativity is that the halachic system values rabbis who are able to kind of bring their own ingenuity and, 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 and creativity to the table. The problem is these three principles are very, very difficult to reconcile one with the other. And you, know, and you can get around it if you say, oh, faithfulness isn't, isn't true. Where there's a halachic will, there's a halachic way. 
But as we saw, that's not so e that's not such a simple thing to say. Or you could try and water down your pluralism and say, oh, it's not real, it's not really pluralism. There are halachic facts, but um, even though there are halachic facts, God allows us to rely on um, intellectual procedure. As long as you did your best in coming to an answer, you're allowed to rely on the answer you come to, but the answer might be wrong. But if you look at the sources, that's not what it seems is happening. It seems that until the rabbis make a decision, there isn't a right answer, or there's more than one right answer. Uh, so, we, so basically, the puzzle still remains. And uh, in next week's class, um, at, at the beginning of next week's class, I'll try and, 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 and give you what I take to be a satisfactory solution to the puzzle. Um, but, I, but I don't want that to take the entire time because we will be speaking about something else. Now, I know there are people with their hands raised and I'm very happy to stay on after the class to discuss with you guys. But for the moment, I'll just hand over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Excellent class. Thank Would you. you like to take some questions first? Yeah, I'm so happy to. Yes, I, okay. I see two. I see two hands. The first one I saw was uh, um, Rav Nachman Nachman? Kursky. Oh, Okay. Hi, how are you? Do you hear me? Hi, it's nice to see you. Yes. You too. So, implicit in this theological conversation, I believe there's a underlying principle, and that somehow we or the rabbis have evolved to be partners with God. And once we build that kind of discussion into your presentation, we're not really left with only three contradictory pieces. Mm -hmm. It's as if, you know, God, you know, has, you know, charged us with literally being his partners, whatever that means. Absolutely. Um, and that reduces, you know, I believe, if you can see your way there, that conflict. I completely agree with you. And in the beginning of next week's class, uh, I'll discuss how that works. To put it in other words, the conflict here between the three principles is actually relatively superficial. Once you factor in a theology of revelation, we need to know what revelation is, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, right? And we need to know what role we play in revelation and what role God plays in revelation. And if you have a story to tell about, about what revelation is and how it works, then maybe we're, we're going to be able to resolve this conflict. And I think we will be able to resolve this conflict. It might not be quite as simple as it seems, because it still seems to be the fact that on su sometimes the rabbi's hands do seem to be tied and sometimes they don't seem to be tied and trying to figure out exactly when and how and the contours of that, there's some work to do still. But I, I fundamentally agree with you. The answer is going to be um, provided to us by a theory of revelation. Um, and that's not really there in Jeff Helmreich's paper. He, 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 he kind of gestures towards it at the end. And that's what I want to kind of add at the beginning of next week. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and I saw a couple more hands. I see uh, Phyllis and Wendy, but I'll, I'll go to Phyllis first because I saw it first. Hi. This Hello. may come under the category of pluralism, uh, but I'm not sure. Um, the, uh, the reform and reconstructionist mm -hmm. quote, denominations do believe in patrilineal descent. Thank you. Okay. Now, current halacha in the orthodox world is matrilineal descent. Mm -hmm. Yet we know there was patrilineal descent. Sure there was, before Ezra it, at least. Until it changed. Now, mm -hmm. it seems to me that that is a matter of study for everyone in the mm -hmm. Jewish community. Uh, Orthodox, Haredi, whatever. Yes. Um, but it's not, and it it's just been. I don't. Has it? What I'm trying to say is, has it ever been really seriously studied, mm -hmm. or is it just a pox on your house? Your oh, I think it's. I think it's a great <laughs> question, and I think I think it has been seriously studied. 
I would say, I mean, I think a lot of Orthodox Jews on the street, just like a lot of Reform uh, and Reconstructionist Jews on the street, are, are less informed than they could be. So I think there are a lot of Orthodox Jews on the street who don't even know that there was a time when patrilineal descent was the norm, right? And that there was some sort of flip at, at one point in history. But the experts, the halachic experts do know that, right? Uh, the, the, great, the great Orthodox decisors of Jewish law know that. Um, but the reason I think the example is, is, is pertinent to us is because the, questions, the question comes, there's a certain amount of openness that, that the doctrine of pluralism presents the halachic system. But also we know that this openness seems to get closed sometimes, right? So until the bat kol, until the heavenly voice said the halacha follows Hillel, it was truly underdetermined who the halacha followed. And you could say, Elu ve Elu div Elu Kim Chaim, these, you know, they're both fine, right? So right now, you know, some people say quinoa is okay and some people say quinoa is not okay. There hasn't really emerged a consensus in the Ashkenazi world, you know, in, in the Ashkenazi world that takes halacha seriously, there hasn't really emerged anything like a consensus. The, the question we have to, to, to discuss is when a consensus does emerge, does it then get closed? Is the matter then sealed? And can it be opened up again, right? So I think the, author, the general orthodox approach is um, the matter of matrilineal descent was sealed, at least in the time of Ezra. And since it got sealed by a consensus, it wasn't open to be re, you know, readdressed. Likewise, the halachic disputes between, between Hillel and Shammai they were open questions until that voice came out and closed it. And from then on, the law follows Hillel. You're not allowed to follow Shammai anymore, right? Yeah, but can, this, is, this is kind of a, a, a ridiculous analogy, yet mm -hmm. it is an analogy as to what seems to be unsealed. And that is in, in the Haredi community, um, in, in one sect, there is uh, a woman's, uh, the length of her skirt is right, two right. inches beneath right. the knee. And in another one, it's four inches. And no, they no, I hear you. marry, they wouldn't marry someone from the other community. Yeah, I hear you. And it's sealed in both communities. It, <laughs> good, really, good. it really, really is. That's absolutely you're 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 raising a great point, and and I don't really have an I don't really have an answer to you because some of these questions are less philosophical and more sociological. But as as a as a kind of philosopher of Judaism, the, the best I can do is help us to articulate the question. And the question is, when does the halachic system allow a question to remain open? When does the halachic system say the question is settled? And when does the halachic system seem to have the permission to reopen questions that once seem to have been settled? And, and you know, we've got sarach ion, as the rabbis say, we need to study this further, there's more to do. But, but at least- yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but it's interesting that dissent, patrilineal and matrilineal is such a current issue oh, absolutely. within the Jewish world absolutely. that you think it would be a, a, a focus of open study, no matter yeah, what I suppose, the I suppose the, to. Again, so this becomes more sociological, but I suppose the Orthodox authorities are just, look, this was well and this one was well and truly closed, you know, more than 2000 years ago. Um, um, but you're asking a legitimate question. What, you know, why is it that, so, you know, that the Orthodox are willing to say that some questions are still open and some questions are closed? What is the limit of this pluralism? If it's I can intersect, here. aren't there yeah. principles of jurisprudence like Gezerah? And when a Gezerah is set forth, you really need a tribunal greater in number and the original tribunal. That's and that one. if some of these things were set forth in that way, you know, not that I wouldn't want to open some of them up, but yeah. that you know, but they did have closure. That's I mean, correct. The there whole, is a, the, the, the whole there is a, of, of Moshe Feinstein really deals exactly. to his igros, deals with this issue, and sets forth, 
you know, some of those principles based yes. upon the Rambam and Ilhas Mamre. Yes, I would, I would agree. I would agree with you. It, it, it in the great decisors, it, it is not arbitrary which things they think are open and which things they think are closed. But it is a, it's a complex matter, and and you're right. Uh, Nachum's pointing out that there's some area of rabbinic law is its own category, and they're called gezerot, which are like a type of rabbinic injunction. And those we have a principle that if they've been sealed, no one has the authority to unseal them unless, basically you would need a Sanhedrin, <laughs> you would need a Sanhedrin again, that was universally recognized to have the same number and the same greatness of learning. Um, and, and you know, try, you know, trying to reestablish that, I'm not even sure would be a good idea, right? But, um, but that does mean that certain things are closed. It, interestingly, though, pat patrilineal descent isn't understood in rabbinic law to be a gazera, right? It's not, you know, it's understood to be perhaps, you know, the, the, the transition happened at Sinai, according to some. I, speak, that, these questions are above my pay grade. The best I can hope to do is to give people a vocabulary to to raise the questions more precisely and and, and if, if that much we've done that i hope i you know i hope we've achieved something and so far what we've done is we've articulated the question in terms of a conflict between faithfulness plur, uh, pluralism and creativity they all three of those doctrines seem to have deep roots in the jewish system yet they conflict with one another and what phyllis is raising is certain instances in which that conflict still seems to be alive and what Rav Nachum has suggested to us is that some account of revelation and the partnership between God and man, some sort of theology is needed here. And that's going to help us, you know, at least come up with our own position about how we would like to resolve these conflicts. And one last question was from Wendy. Yes. I'm not philosophical by nature, so my answer, look, <laughs> I look at things in a different way and I want to be exposed to this. But I'm thinking of how different Jewish communities uh, after being separated for many generations, centuries, whatever, uh, particularly see it in Israel, uh, come together, and there are strong differences. I mean, take even the, the, the simple one we all know, Kitniot. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Israel, people live side by side, um, each uh, observing the other, and yeah. neither side is winning, and both are equally can be equally religious or not religious yeah. as they as they are, but these things evolved because there wasn't a voice coming down constantly from heaven telling you which is right. And as time went, you know, there was a problem getting this kind of food. Why do Russian Jews, uh, the traditionally the old ones, use potatoes at Pesach to dip yeah. in the salt water? Yeah. Because they couldn't get a green. Couldn't afford, couldn't afford anything else. Yeah. There was no green vegetables at that yeah. time of year. Yeah. So, but the point is that didn't make the Russian Jews, of uh, which my ancestors came, uh, unorthodox. Un <laughs> God forbid. But because they had developed that, well, potatoes. You know, if you leave them around long enough, they turn green on the outside. But you don't. Oh, eat well, that's them. Yeah. well, that's good. So they are green vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> But they will kill you if you eat them when they were green vegetable. But you know, who knows what the reasoning was? It looks like it looks like maybe you know uh, the, something else. But these things existed. Yeah. Many of them now we look and we, we are able to communicate with people yeah. who couldn't in those days. So we can always constantly we could theoretically have a single organization that took all the yeah. questions and solved them. But that would we might we might not want that, you know. Yeah, we might that, not want exactly. Exactly. So that this is that there is that there is some room for flexibility. Absolutely. To some kind of uh, whether physical separation or whatever, or yeah. people develop intellectually in different directions or whatever. Uh, yeah, this is this is this is really beautiful, Andy. I mean, think of it this way. Um, um, there was a time when, when Jewish practice was much more uniform than it is today because the diaspora was less wide, right? There were, we were just in, in Babylon and, and Palestine, yeah. right? And, and there, there were differences. Right, there were differences, but they were less pronounced than, than the differences there are today between, let's say, Russian and Yemenite Jewry, yes. right? And what would happen is there would be debates 
And the pluralism that we're speaking about in, in the Talmud would say, well, okay, until a consensus emerges, elu elu divrei chayim, this is okay, and that's okay. Once a consensus emerged, then you'd get uniformity again on a certain issue. So you had, you know, you had much earlier, you have the Academy of Hillel, the Academy of Shammai, for three years, there's no conformity of practice because some are following Shammai, some are following Hillel. Then a consensus emerges. From now on, we all follow Hillel. But once the diaspora got wider, you know, so I was speaking in, in, to, 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 to Nachum and Phyllis, I was speaking in terms of some questions being open and then they get closed. But what you're showing us, Wendy, is that in, in, in contemporary Jewish law, some questions get partially closed, which is to say they get closed for a given community one way and closed for another community another way, which is actually a whole new type of pluralism, which isn't elu ve'elu. It's not these and these are divrei kim chayim. It's that's asur for the Ashkenazim and that's mutar for the Sephardim because it got closed kind of partially, which I think you're, you're right. There's a whole new form of, 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 of pluralism in, in, in Jewish law. And you see that modern day halachic decisors respect this. If you go to a halachic authority in Israel and you ask a question, they will very often say, well, hold on a minute, are you Ashkenazi or are you Sephardi? Because this is an issue where Ashkenazi and Sephardi law differ. I'll tell you what you should do if you're a Sephardi and I'll tell you what you should do if you're Ashkenazi, right? So, so that's kind of a, a, a whole new type of legal pluralism that's post Talmud. Right, you know, it's, it's um, interesting. Wendy. Confronting the modern world, we have a new set of divisions that yes. are coming up as to how much weight is given to yes. halacha and to right. the decisors of halacha. And, yes. and where does this fit? And how far can it stretch? And we're still all Jews. We'll talk about this tomorrow. I mean, the question that Phyllis, uh, not tomorrow, I mean next week, the question that Phyllis raises is interesting because she raises a question where the main orthodox decisors are not willing to be pluralistic, right? They're not willing to say, oh, and if you're reconstructionist, then, then this, yeah. right? They yeah. will say, if you're Ashkenazi, if you're Sephardi, if you're Yemenite, but they won't say, oh, but, and if you're a former or you're reconstructionist. So what are, the, what are the limits of this system? What, you know, what is the nature of its flexibility? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you the best fullest most watertight answer that will satisfy everyone but my challenge at the beginning of next week is to add in some theological aspects that might help us at least begin to resolve the tension between some of these doctrines and help us to un understand the scope yeah. of flexibility and uh, diversity within Jewish law. Yeah. I mean I'm thinking even if you look at the pandemic that we've been having um, mm -hmm. how far can you stretch Zoom? Yeah, I mean, there's been a flurry of... A, a, a tremendous amount of discussion and, and, and act, action one way or the other on this whole Zoom. There's been a, there's been a blossoming of, of literature about the halachic ramifications of Zoom. It's a re, you know, it's an area of halachic growth and we need to talk and about understanding halachic growth. On Friday and have it functioning on Shabbos. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, people have given serious thought to this. They have indeed. With the conservative and with the Orthodox community, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. how you evaluate in terms of your own community, which is more essential. Indeed, I hope. Is like I said, I hope. To be able to get those guys to come to some kind of service. I hear. On Zoom, or are you worried that if they're not going to go to services for a year on Zoom, uh, they're going to give up services completely? And the other way, I mean. I live in the mix of this because I have friends on both sides. And uh -huh. I belong to organizations on both sides. One both sides. And one where I go for the summer because that's what's there in the summer. And you have, you know, then you have to make your own decision within this. I hear you. It's a new, uh, it's a new thing. So, so I do hope that, all, that a lot of these issues will receive a little bit more resolution at the beginning of next week before we move on to the second of our three questions. Okay. okay thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Levens. I'm looking nice forward to, to next week. And thank you, you everyone too. else.
And yay, everyone else who joined us today on Zoom, and Andresha Live and on Facebook, we love having you with us. Uh, we continue our spring program this Monday at 1 p.m. with the final class on the halachic process, A Brief History with Rabbi Ziering. So I hope to see you there. In addition, we have many more classes happening right now and always. You can find out more information as well as the registration links on our website at www.drisha.org classes. Or you can watch live. All the classes are recorded. So you can always go to uh, www.drisha.org slash live and watch uh, our classes, either a recording or a live class. Thank you again, Dr. Levens, uh, for Thank the opportunity you. to uh, learn with you. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended. And I hope to see you at one of our upcoming classes, either next week or another class here at Drisha. Thank Good you.